that started early on in the history of this earth, it continues today. It's insidious and it's deadly. It's a cover-up. Adam and Eve sinned, they cast blame, and they attempted an external cover-up. Well, who wouldn't? And I ask, who hasn't? Have you ever tried to gloss over something you did? You don't have to answer to me. Answer for yourself. Did you ever try to cover up something and explain it away? Well, it really didn't happen that way, and I'm really not to blame. It's everybody else. Oh. Who hasn't tried to cover up? But their problem was more than skin deep. And fig leaves were not going to fill the bill, as it were, to solve that problem. But God designed and provided a solution to the problem. And it's hinted at in Genesis 3. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for them. Now many believe that right there is the first glimmer of that uh, animal sacrificial system that would grow up, which were to point people's minds to Christ, the true Messiah, who would come and die for the sin of all the world. But a religion of externals has always been pleasing to the human heart. But a religion of externals never suffices, not back in history and not today. You see, a religion of externals panders to the perverseness of the human heart. Somehow we'd like to, think we can, think we need to, maybe we might be able to do something, anything, to appease God and find favor with Him and thus deserve or earn our salvation. Have you ever operated in that fashion? Again, don't answer to me. If you think about it. Have I operated in that fashion? Have I thought I needed to do something, say something, be something, to win God's favor, to appease Him, to earn my salvation? Hmm. Sin causes perverseness from inside out, doesn't it? Yes. Causes perverseness. And sometimes, some people can focus on the externals as being the sum and substance of all religion. Yet a religion of externals has never sufficed, never will suffice, but it's pleasing to the human heart. We can save ourselves, we'll put save in quotes. We can save ourselves or think we're saving ourselves without having to deal with ourselves at the core. You with me? Some of you with me? Sometimes some people want salvation in their sin and with their sin rather than from their sin. Christ came to save people from their sin. Amen? Some people want to paint the outside of the house. The foundation's rotten and the timbers are eaten with termites. But we're going to paint the outside. It's going to look nice. And I will fool everybody, including myself. Let's go to Matthew 6. We're well aware of Christ's words spoken against this kind of attitude and practice of his day. Matthew 6. Starting at verse 1 through 5 and then 16 to 18, it says, Take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. How does that hit us? Don't do your charity before men. Do it in secret. He says, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, that they may have glory of men. And that's all they end up with, correct? The glory of men. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. That your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your father who sees in secret, he himself will reward you openly. When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. They love to be standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. 
Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward from other people. 16 to 18 says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face. Don't let it appear that you're fasting. Don't parade that to somebody else. Let it be known to God, and God who knows it all will act and reward accordingly. So you and I have heard these words. Let's go to Matthew 23, a very well-known chapter, where the word hypocrite occurs many times, correct? Some time ago I talked to you about that H word, did I not? Hypocrite. It's the deceitful assumption of virtue. Pretending that you are something that you are not. Matthew 23, 25 to 28 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first clean the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. They were good at whitewashing the outside. They would paint the house, the foundation is crumbling, and the timbers are eat up with termites, but they're fine. They're doing fine. At least they think they are. They're trying to portray that, and they, in fact, are hypocrites. Huh. Well, we applaud Christ, don't we? It took courage to say these things. Sometimes we think, well, he really put them in their place. But you know, if anybody ever hinted to us that our religion ran in the vein of their religion, that we majored on the externals rather than the internal, what would our reaction be? Would you want to do to them what they wanted to do to Christ? Crucify him? No. <laughs> Would you thank them? Are you with me? I'm not hitting the nail, am I? What is our religion like? Is it external? Whitewashed on the outside? Tied on? from the outside? You know, the internal fruit is indispensable. The internal fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, has to be present for true external fruit to be produced. We have to be Christ-like on the inside, right? We cannot tie on good things on the outside. Didn't Christ himself say that good trees bear good fruit? Bad trees bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good, and a good tree cannot bear bad, and so what kind of tree are we inside? And is the fruit that we're bearing natural? Is it valid? Is it what it ought to be? What a rebuke these words were to Christ. Well, not to Christ, from Christ to the Pharisees. You look good on the outside, you are good at pretending. You are good at making a show inside. Oh, if anybody could see. But maybe they suspected. But you know, God sees inside, doesn't he? Amen. And he's telling them their internal fruit is rotten. So any external fruit they produced would be rotten also. Correct? A rotten tree, tree produces rotten fruit. So Christ also made a comment about some of their external fruit. In verse 15 of Matthew 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, or one convert. When he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Wow. No wonder they wanted to crucify him. 
If you were the leaders of that day, and you had this young upstart itinerant preacher going around saying this stuff, to me, the leaders, why, no wonder they hated him. Rotten on the inside. What comes out of their life is still rotten. They make a proselyte or a convert that's twice as deserving of hell as they themselves. Now that's a real slap, isn't it? It's a real slap. Do you believe it's possible to be a convert to a church, a set of teachings, or a charismatic figure and still be a son of hell? Think that's possible? Now we're in the thanksgiving spirit, right? You're, you're thankful for what you're hearing today. It's a warning. You and I have to be converted to Christ. Pure and simple. We can't depend on our pedigree. We'll get into that maybe a little bit. You and I have to be converted to him. And internally be changed and transformed. So that what comes out on the outside is valid and real. The internal fruit has to be there for the external fruit to be right and good. And so we might ask ourselves, what kind of trees are we? Are we good trees that are transformed from inside out? That we have the grace and spirit of Christ within us and the fruit that comes out is good? Or are we still in our flesh, abiding in some kind of sin, trying to cover it over, albeit, sewing together our fig leaves of sorts, masquerading as whatever we may masquerade as, and who are we fooling? <laughs> Self? Maybe we fool some people. We never fool God, do we? Never fool God. So ask ourselves, what kind of trees are we? What kind of fruit do we have? Is it all valid? Is it all real? Now, we're told in the Word that we should um, understand from the mistakes of those who've gone before, correct? We should uh, gain from their examples. And one thing we can gain from some of the things that are written is that not all those who are in a church may necessarily be in Christ. And this is a simple concept. You've heard it before, and we need to keep it in mind. There were leaders in Christ's day who were such sticklers for every jot and tittle of the law, we'll say, but inside they were rotten, and they hated him, the one who was prophesied to come. They hated him and got him killed. My goodness. My goodness. So not all those who say they are of Israel, Paul would later write, they are not all Israel. It's not really not, you can't depend on, oh, we have Abraham for our father. You can't depend on that. Can't depend on it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 5. First Corinthians chapter five, yes. <clears throat> this comes under the idea that not all who are in a congregation or a denomination may be in Christ. And we've said this before, right? You've thought this, you know this. This is this is reality. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous 
or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. That's pretty drastic, isn't it? For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. Now, we know we say the church is a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. But when we come into the hospital, especially this hospital that's run by the great physician, we're supposed to be healed of our disease. And our disease, is, which is leprosy. Now, did I talk about that last time I was here? Did I? And what was the title of the sermon? What was it two weeks ago? Anybody remember? I'm looking for a bulletin. I can't remember the title. <laughs> I preach, I can't remember the title. It'll come to me. But it's about the leprosy of sin, Right? And we need to see ourselves in that group of lepers that came to Christ, said, Son of David, Christ, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. So, some in the church can be masquerading, and some are truly converted. Paul lets that be known. Let's go to chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. One through three, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For even now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Envy, strife, and divisions. If you notice chapter 1 through 3, he's just talking about people who split up following different Christian leaders. He said even that should not happen because Christ is the supreme leader of all. But there are those, we could say, who are, Paul says they're still carnal. They're in the fellowship. And Paul says that people need to be converted, right? Right? die daily, be reborn into the image of Christ. You know, Paul wrote in Romans that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yet, has it ever been, or how many times has it been, that those things, the eating and the drinking, are made to summon substance of religion. Now you and I, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have certain, we might call them lifestyle issues, correct? They are external. They're visible to some. They're verifiable. And do we eat right? Do we drink right? Do we dress right? Do we smell right? Hmm. Now, I'm not discounting the externals. Many would say those are the fruit of one's salvation. They're not the root. They're the result of being connected to Christ. But has it ever happened where people will view the externals and make judgments about themselves or about other people and their relation to God or their own relation to God based on what you can see and observe and quantify when you don't know the heart. We can use some of the minutia of life to make those judgments. Hmm. I won't ask you if you've ever done that, but you know if you might have. What we see, what we hear, what we understand, and we have perceptions of others, and then we can make judgments that may or may not be accurate. You cannot always judge the book by its cover. But you say, yeah, well, what's inside comes outside. And you see what's outside. But who's the true judge? 
He's the true judge. You can remember Christ's words about the two men who went to pray. One succeeded in applying a new coat of whitewash to himself. And one just prayed in humility. One went home justified. And one went home patting himself on the back like he had been. A religion of externals will never do, will never suffice. And he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I fast. I tithe. I whatever. I'm good. This guy over here, oh, he don't have a prayer. I'm glad I ain't like him. I know ain't ain't a word, but it just came out. Hmm. The kingdom of God is not eating, drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But have we ever been judged by others based on the externals? Have we ever judged somebody else based on their externals? Could it be that we would spend so much time assessing our externals and somebody else's externals that we are robbed of the joy and peace and are robbed of receiving Christ's righteousness when we're trying to spin a righteousness of our own. Adam and Eve did it. Cover up. I didn't do it. It was the woman. I didn't do it. It was the serpent. What's the fig leaves all about? Well, you know, we were naked. Who told you? How'd you figure that one out? Good night. Now, could it be that we as the ancient people of God, still stumble over the stumbling stone, the rock of offense. We refuse to accept Christ's righteousness, but want to spin a righteousness of our own, or think we can at least help. We, we'd like to think we can do something, need to do something, to appease God and earn our salvation. Christ said this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom Christ has sent. And if we don't start there, then we're going to be robbed of the true peace and the true joy while we try to spin our own righteousness. And it's not going to work. It was tried before. I dare say the Pharisees were better at it than I am. And Christ told his followers, if your righteousness doesn't exceed theirs, you don't get in. And they might be wondering, well, how, how am I supposed to do more and better than them? So, well, you just junk all that. That's not, that's not what works. That's not what gets you into heaven. Hmm. Paul wrote these words. He says, a true Jew, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart by the Spirit. Paul wrote about Abraham. He said he received the sign of circumcision, an external sign. That was the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. So what came first? The righteousness of the faith that he had while he was uncircumcised. That was first. Then he received the sign of circumcision as an external sign. That's all in Romans 4. You can read it. Paul also wrote that the Gentiles who did not pursue a righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, by externals. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Could it be we're still stumbling over the truth? Could it be? Could it be we major on the externals rather than the internals? Could it be that we, who we believe and we are a favored people on earth, could we turn into those who said we have Abraham as our father? Could we turn into those who said the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these, and we trust in some external trapping of religion, when our heart is filthy. Could it be that 
we trust in the idea that we are a Seventh-day Adventist. I had a discussion in the class today. You can read in 1 Samuel. You can read about the sons of Eli and the sons of Samuel. They did not follow the lead of the father. And we trust that the prophet and the priest taught their kids a right, but it didn't take, they didn't take it, they didn't put their faith in it, and they didn't uh, follow on. And that, that episode, especially with Samuel's sons, that led the people to say to Samuel, look, you're getting old, you're about finished, your sons aren't following your way, we want a king. And you know how they did get a king and how their history went downhill. We talked a little bit about what happens to the second generation of people. What it, it is the experience of learning something for the first time and being a convert to Seventh-day Adventism, we'll say in particular, is that a more uh, powerful experience than having been raised in the church? You have to answer that if you were raised in the church. Some of us are first-generation converts. And then we think, what happens with the second generation? Do they take what you gave them? Do they always follow through on what you taught them? We have the example of the sons of Eli, the sons of Samuel, they didn't. So your children if they're getting the instruction in your home that's wonderful but it ultimately boils down to the choices and decisions they will make as they grow up because salvation is a personal experience between each individual and God and we cannot rest on our laurels as it were just because we are part of this denomination. And yet, people who are in this denomination, if they're not anchored in Christ, there's predictions they will go out, be blown away, blown out like leaves. Huh. Could it be we repeat history sometime? Could it be? Could I be a Pharisee? Could I depend on things I've done, things I've said, initials behind my name, education, whatever? God, spare me from that. Spare me from that. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, is the song. You know, the Apostle Paul, let's turn to 2 Timothy 3. We read in 1 Corinthians 5 how he talked about not associating with so-called brothers who do certain things. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3, he says the same, uh, he talks about this again, and he uh, gets to verse 5 and makes a point. He says, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, Men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and holy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. But in spite of it all, they have a form of godliness but deny its power. From such keep away. If you look in our commentary, it talks about form of godliness as doing the churchy things like church attendance, church donations, and church work, and whatever it may be. And you can do that and still not be in Christ. Is that frightening to us? Should be. Should be. A form of godliness with no power, externals going through motions, going through a ritual, something that is pleasing to the human heart because it can become a checklist and I can go down my checklist and I check it all off. Therefore, I must be a pretty good person. God said, have mercy. Have mercy. Let me, let me shine the spotlight on you. 
and let me show you what you're really like. You ever had that happen, where God shines a spotlight? Oh, goodness. Go, forgive me. So Paul says to avoid these things. A religion of externals, a second-hand proxy experience, because it's all worthless. It amounts to nothing. He had that himself, did he not? And then he said, when I came to Christ, what did he consider his former accomplishments to be? A manure pile, basically, a dung heap, garbage. You ever been near a manure pile? Yep. You ever moved the manure pile from the barn to the pile? Have mercy, right? And he says, that was my former accomplishments. It's like a dung pile. And he said, I want to be in Christ and have that righteousness which comes by faith. So a religion of externals never does, it never suffices, it never works. It's just a cover-up, a whitewash. It's a sham. It's a form of godliness. There's no power. We go through a ritual, we go through motions, we spin our wheels, and nothing much may come out of it. Hmm. You all still with me? You still thankful today? Thursday, Friday, Sabbath. Two days after Thanksgiving, Friday, Sabbath, today, yeah. Salvation is an individual thing. It's secured by grace through faith. And when you and I do that work that Christ spoke of, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom, whom God has sent, which was Christ. When we start there and then let him change us from within, and that's where it all starts, then yeah, we are transformed. We become a good tree. And the fruit that comes out of our life is a good and beneficial fruit. It's valid because it's God's power. It's not something we nailed on to the tree. We're tied to it. Let's find the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Some time ago, we spent, uh, I think it was eight weeks in the book of Galatians. Chapter 5, 1 through 4. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You notice what he says? You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Paul and the New Testament are never against law keeping as a guide for life for those who are in a saving relation with Christ. Amen? They're never against law-keeping as a guide for life for those who are in a saving relationship. In fact, the law of God, we look at the Ten Commandments, that becomes the template of your life, and you can walk in that way because Christ has made you new on the inside. Correct? He's given you a new heart, and he writes his law on your heart, and you walk in that way. The issue in Galatians was attempting to use the law as a method of justification. If I do certain things, then I will be okay. Have you ever done that? I'll ask you again. You answer for yourself. Have I ever set up my own checklist? I got to do this, 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 and this. And Paul said, you're saved by grace through faith. And once you're saved by grace through faith in a saving relationship, then all the stuff on that checklist becomes your life, how you live. It becomes natural and valid. It's not something that you try to work up or tie on to the tree of your life. It's natural and valid. Hmm. Paul made a comment. He said Christ was the end of the law. And the word end means goal. Christ is the goal of the law. The law condemns us, puts us on death row, so that maybe we come to our senses and move to Christ so we can be justified by faith. That's the goal of the law. The law is our jailer, as it were condemning us to death row 
I should die for my sin. But when I come to my senses like the kid in the pigsty, and I go to Christ and I'm justified by faith, that's part of what the law was designed to do. To knock us in the head. You have broken this law. You are worthy of death. You are on death row. How do you get out of here? Well, yeah, I heard that story about Jesus. He died for me, so I'm going to go to him and ask forgiveness. So Christ said himself that he would make us free, and we would be free indeed. Free from the guilt of our past sin, and we believe free from the power of our present sinning, don't we? We are supposed to be new and different. Yet... Is it ever happening that we ourselves can enslave ourselves to some kind of external checklist for life? Where we put up a checklist and think, if I do all these things, I will earn my salvation, I will help God, I will help merit it, I will do whatever. Or has it ever happened where somebody else enslaves us with their checklist? of external things that you ought to do. And again, I'm not disparaging the externals of life. They are the fruit of one's salvation and one's relationship to Christ. You ought to and need to be careful what you eat, what you drink, certain things or no, all the time. Illicit drugs, no. You can't destroy your body and destroy your mind. Because you are purchased with a price. You are not your own. Christ owns us. Huh. What kind of religion do we have? Are we truly born again? New creatures in Christ? Who are truly transformed from within? And we become a new tree. And on that tree is good and valid fruit that God produces. Or are we still abiding in the flesh, trying to sew together our own righteousness, trying to muster up some kind of things that look like fruit when it's just man's tinkering? So where are we? Hmm. That's something we need to consider, isn't it? Where are we? Where are we? Do we have that religion of, that starts on the inside? Or that's just whitewashed on the outside? Are we truly free? Or are we enslaved to some kind of man-made checklist through which we think we're going to earn our salvation or deserve it or at least help? We did something. What did Isaiah say? Even our righteousness, even our righteousness is as a filthy rag. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And as I cling to that cross, and you live in me through the Holy Spirit, then you change me. And our kids need the same experience. The parents can teach, but it boils down to the choices the kids make. And I know if your kids are grown and they may or may not always make the choices you had instilled in them to make, it's still their choice. And you did what you could do. And then you pray, right? You pray every day. Every day that God gets through to them and some of those seeds you planted will sprout and that they too have a revival and a reformation in their life. So, those are thoughts I was planning to share with you today. Hopefully you will find something to consider and think about and pray about and counsel with yourself. Where are you today? Amen.